Yeah. So her first question was, how did I find my way to my career as a journalist and a writer and investigating corporate contributions to the ill health of our planet? And I guess as a journalist, you know, I, I always wanted to be a journalist. I never wanted to be anything else. So it was pretty easy. I uh, knew from probably 12, 13 years old, um, that was what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was influenced by a book, um, well, and a movie, more the movie probably than the book, All the President's Men. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that, right? And Watergate and how these two Washington Post reporters, uh, you know, who, you know, weren't particularly, you know, known, well-known or well-respected, um, but how they uncovered this giant story and this giant scandal and ultimately their work exposed, you know, this, this wrongdoing to the public and took down the president of the United States. And I just thought that was phenomenal. And I thought that journalism was probably the very best thing you could ever do on the planet because the way I've always seen it is I get paid to go out into the world and meet really interesting people who are doing really interesting and important work, um, or, you know, meaningful in some way. And then I get to tell everybody else about it, you know, and, and get paid for that. You know, I think it's, I think it's a really rare and wonderful thing. And I'm very glad to be part of that and have been doing it now for 30 some years. Um, what have you learned about how to write effectively and get your writing published? Um, I think I would answer that as saying throughout my career, I've primarily been a, a business reporter covering corporate issues. I've also covered political and, and national news uh, from a general news perspective, but um, I've always gravitated towards corporate uh, issues, things that are driven by by data, um, you know, really where you can, you can explain um, information uh, with evidence behind it, not just anecdotal information. But I've also found that the way to convey that information to people and make them care or to have it resonate is to tell personal stories of individuals who are affected by the public policy issue I'm writing about or, you know, who are involved in the story in some way. Um, for instance, way back when, you know, gosh, when was this, the early 2000s, uh, the Iraq war, uh, we were having a lot of um, uh, pushback against the Iraq war. There was a, a big public policy debate going on in Washington, D.C. and across the country as more and more Americans started to push back against the war. And we were seeing a lot of uh, young Americans come home, you know, in body bags and that sort of thing. And so one of my assignments for Reuters was, was to write about that debate. And the way that I wanted to do that was to tell, to open my story and to tell the story of, of a new widow. You know, and I went to her small town and sat with her in her home, you know, as she awaited the delivery, you know, of the flag, uh, you know, and the remains of her husband um, and that sort of thing. And so open my story with that. And I've tried to do that in my books and all my writing to just really bring it home to, you know, who it affects um, and how, how we're all connected um, through these stories. Uh, challenges I faced as a writer. <laughs> the biggest challenges, I guess, um, we can get to talking about, but uh, when I started covering the chemical industry, the agrochemical industry, and these big companies, Monsanto and DuPont and Syngenta, uh, I got... Not at the very beginning, um, but as I became more knowledgeable and a more sophisticated observer and writer about these, the problems that uh, were being found, uh, these companies pushed back on me pretty hard. Monsanto, in particular, uh, really came after me. And, um, you know, there's, I can share these links later, but they uh, made it part of a campaign. Um, internally and spent quite a lot of money to destroy my reputation, to interfere with my career, to try to uh, downplay my books. Um, there, there was a whole, we, we found out through litigation, there was a whole internal plan. They had a spreadsheet set up uh, called the Carrie Gillum Book Plan. And they hired consultants in Washington, DC to uh, use third parties to try to 
smear my reputation and write untrue things about me and have that published around the world. And um, it was really quite interesting <laughs> to see the lengths they went to, uh, to try to, to ruin me and ruin the books. Um, my process here, this is question four. Talk about your process for researching and writing. Um, gosh, uh, you know, I just, you're asking questions, right? Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, I guess my, my book, I could talk about my first book, Whitewash. Um, the process for researching and writing that uh, was really took place over 20 some years. You know, it was gathering science, uh, scientific studies, talking to scientists, uh, talking to farmers, agronomists, uh, people who were part of this story and trying to understand the different perspectives and the different context for each of the different parties uh, that were influenced by the stories that I was pursuing and uh, then trying to distill that down. So my process is not a very good one, probably very, not a very efficient one. Uh, I know that there are people who are really savvy in the way that they take notes and they compile them and all these really high tech ways, I think, to sift and sort through. Um, and I don't really do that. I have like big piles of papers and documents and cabinets filled with files and, uh, you know, and I have thumb drives kind of scattered throughout drawers. Um, that is one of the goals that I have is to be learn somehow in my old age to become a little bit more organized. But, um, you know, so far, I guess it's worked pretty well for me. I'm a pretty fast writer. Um, so maybe I overcome that. Um, what makes for effective publishable nonfiction writing for journalistic writing? I think I'd go back to the way I answered number two. I really believe in whatever story I'm doing that it's important to bring it home to the individual. And whether it's a story about water quality or you know, EPA regulations about air quality or USDA data on pesticide residues in foods, um, you know, or something like that, you really want, you know, why do we care? Why is this important? Um, it's important because we all eat the food, you know, we breathe the air, we drink the water. Uh, we're going to have kids or grandkids, or we have friends who have kids who are going to be living, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. We want a world that is healthier for them um, in which they can live and thrive and, and um, have a happy and, and secure life. And, and that's what motivates me, I guess. And that's the way I want to tell my stories and the context that I want to put all my information into. Um, read excerpts from your books. <laughs> okay, well, we can get to that. Um, how do you get articles published? So I left Reuters, we should talk about this. I started with Reuters in 1998 uh, and, and had a long run there and it was a wonderful run and covered a number of different stories. I was on the national correspondence desk. Uh, if you don't know Reuters, Reuters is one of the oldest and largest international news agencies uh, in the world. And I, you know, it was just a wonderful thing to be employed there. I had, uh, you know, the opportunity to meet and to interview, you know, just many influential, powerful, interesting people um, ranging from, you know, somebody like Evander Holyfield for crying out loud uh, to being on the campaign bus with Barack Obama when he was um, a new candidate in 2007. And interestingly enough, I didn't want to be on the campaign bus with Barack Obama because, you know, I wanted to be with Hillary Clinton, you know, because Hillary was a front runner and she was the one who was going to make all the news. But, you know, I, I got the bad assignment. I got assigned to Barack Obama's bus. And, uh, you know, that turned out <laughs> differently than I expected, but it was, it was a fantastic experience. And I think that's a lesson I've learned over the years is that things that I don't necessarily embrace initially, assignments, you know, um, stories, just anything really, just because I don't think it's gonna be fantastic at the beginning, doesn't mean that I shouldn't pursue it. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't dig in and give up my whole um, ability as best as I can. And I've found that those kinds of situations really uh, often turn into the best, the best stories and the best experiences. Um, 
how do you get articles published? So I left Reuters, uh, you know, while I was at Reuters, pretty easy, obviously, because I just would file my stories, boom, and they go out on the wire to the world. When I left Reuters at the end of 2015, uh, I did so to go to work for a nonprofit, um, continuing to write and research and do investigative work on environmental health issues, and to write my first book, Whitewash, uh, which I started writing in 2016, and it was published in 2017. But I also, you know, just wanted to really keep my, my work out there and my news out there. And I was fortunate enough um, to get the attention of The Guardian editors. Uh, and The Guardian is another very influential, powerful, wonderful journalistic organization, uh, particularly when it comes to environmental stories. And uh, so I've been writing fairly regularly for them and you can find my work on The Guardian website. Um, but I've also, I wrote a piece for Time Magazine. I've written for other magazines and articles and it's just really about a good, a good pitch, you know, putting together a short summary of what it is you want to do and why it's meaningful, why it's different than anything else that's already out there, what data, what evidence, what anecdotes you're going to have and pitching that uh, to the editors. So uh, that has worked pretty well for me so far. I should say I'm getting ready uh, at the end of this month I'm launching um, a new news outlet, a new environmental news outlet called the New Lead, L-E-D-E, uh, with the backing and as an initiative of the Environmental Working Group, which is a, uh, a large and old and large environmental group based in Washington, D.C., uh, that has a lot of scientists on staff and does a lot of research in the environment and uh, is a fairly um, influential source uh, with lawmakers and others. So they really wanted to uh, support a journalistic endeavor. And so I'm trying to get that together and I'm looking for freelancers. If anybody out there is interested in writing about human health or environmental stories for a new news outlet. Um, so the last question is what kind of blowback have you faced? I already uh, sort of addressed that I'm gonna put a link just because it's kind of fun to read it maybe in the chat. Although I don't know if you guys watching can I, who are actually there probably can't see the chat, I guess. I, I can put it up. Um, but I thought I would read if it's okay, if it just, I mean, I don't know. I hate to read, it's kind of boring, but these are this the preface to my first book and you can see this is my, whoops, wait, you can't see it. My first book is a whitewash. It's a really ugly cover. I hated the cover, but the publisher told me what went up to me, um, <laughs> the cover. But I'm just going to read the preface because I think this gives you a really good background um, as to how I came to be where I am today, kind of the gal who knows a lot about pesticides, for crying out loud. Um, so is that all right? Everybody can hear me? Nobody's asleep yet? Okay. Uh, it's been nearly 20 years since I first walked into the corporate headquarters of Monsanto Company, a visit that would become one of many over the course of my career as a national correspondent for Reuters, one of the oldest and largest news agencies in the world. Meeting with top executives, scientists, and marketing experts at Monsanto, perhaps the world's best known agricultural powerhouse, was part of a job that called on me to help keep international audiences informed about the ins and outs and evolutions of agriculture in the United States. The type of seeds farmers planted in their fields and the chemicals they use to treat their crops are big business amounting to billions of dollars in revenues for Monsanto and the other companies that sell them. But the fundamentals of growing food ultimately have much larger implications. Not only do farmers choices influence commodity pricing and trade relationships, but they also ultimately affect the health and well being of all of us. The food we eat, the water we drink, the landscape of our environment, all are connected to these seemingly simple choices made by farmers in their fields. Before my 1998 move to the farm state of Kansas to write about agriculture for Reuters, I spent a good deal of my journalism career delving into the financial wheeling and dealing of the big banking, commercial real estate, and insurance industries. I also spent a fair share of my time chasing chaos. I covered the death and destruction wrought by Hurricane Katrina, floods, fires, and droughts, and the countless tornadoes that roared across rural America. And I was dispatched to duck bullets, bricks, and bottles in the race-torn riots of Ferguson, Missouri, and elsewhere. 
When assigned to cover the ag beat, I was at first a bit reluctant. I was skeptical that it could bring the intrigue and excitement I had experienced with the prior work I had done. And I had a lot to learn. My education in food production and farming meant not just sitting down with executives at companies such as Monsanto and rivals Dow, AgroSciences, and DuPont, but also listening to and studying the work of agricultural economists, soil and plant scientists, experts on seed germplasm, and of course, farmers. My favorite times as an ag journalist have been spent in blue jeans and mud boots, traipsing through higher than my head corn stalks with farmers and riding inside the calves of combines alongside the hardworking, often tough talking men and women who understand better than anyone, the risks and rewards of modern food production. I have immense respect and gratitude for these farmers who devote their lives to toiling in unforgiving fields where the harvest bounty often depends on the whims of mother nature and the bulk of the profits go to deep pockets much higher up the food chain. And I stand a bit in awe of the scientists who spend their careers studying how to do more with less, how to grow enough food for an expanding world population in ways that could not even have been imagined a generation ago. When I started down that reporting road, I was an eager student, nearly as impressed with the advanced technologies of modern agriculture as with the people who work the land. I was someone who had never given much thought to what went into the products I purchased at the grocery store. I didn't buy organically grown produce as it seemed too expensive. And I didn't spend time fretting over invisible, invisible chemicals that might lurk in my lunch. The debate about the then nascent technique of making transgenic changes to food crops was a mystery to me. And I was a devoted consumer fan of Monsanto's hit herbicide product, Roundup. I used it, used it liberally in my suburban backyard to keep weeds at bay. But over the years, as my research and reporting expanded to include doubts about the benefits of genetically modified organisms and the risks associated with the chemicals used on them, I became a target of Monsanto's ire. Company representatives and industry surrogates alternately sought to bully me, charm me, intimidate me, and cajole me to write news stories in ways that parroted industry talking points. They told me there was no justification for reporting both sides of the debates over Monsanto's crops and chemicals because the science was settled, all was well, and anyone who questioned that was thwarting Monsanto's mission to feed the world. When I would not adopt the desired narrative, surrogates attempted to assault my character and credibility and made efforts to derail my career. Monsanto executives and representatives from Monsanto funded organizations sought unsuccessfully to convince my editors to yank me off my beat to block further coverage of the issues. They could rarely, if ever, find errors in my reporting. The problem they would complain was one of bias. As you'll see in reading this book, the only bias I hold is for the truth. What I've learned, what I know with certainty, is that when powerful corporations control the narrative, the truth often gets lost, and it's up to journalists to find it and bring it home. That's what I've tried to do with this book. For decades, companies have whitewashed many of the facts about the crops and chemicals that they have helped make a central part of modern agriculture. Yes, there are rewards, but there are also risks, many. And without transparency, none of us can make informed decisions about what we eat and what policies we do or do not want to support. My admiration for American farmers has never waned, but this journey through our nation's food system has left me with a very real fear for my children, for your children, over what the future holds. It's undeniable that we have allowed our food, our water, our soil, our very selves to become dangerously doused with chemicals. And one of the most pervasive, pervasive of those pesticides is the subject of this book. Scientists call it glyphosate, consumers know it as Roundup. It's a weed killer, but it's killing much more than weeds. And the regulatory agencies charged with protecting the public from these dangers have acted intentionally or not in ways that have protected corporate products and profits instead of people. It's not a feel-good story, but it is one that has to be told. And that is my very long-winded introduction <laughs> to whitewash. And I have to say, so how this came about, this book, I was writing, um, covering Monsanto, covering the agrochemical industry, and really the only voice out there, uh, journalist, who was cataloging the emergence of scientific studies that was showing um, all of the harm associated with this really pervasive use of this Roundup product, this glyphosate. 
uh, which came to be the most widely used herbicide in the world, as I as I have said here. And as I'm writing about this, you know, and Monsanto is trying to push back and push back, but I keep writing, and of course, it's going to a global audience, and so people are starting to pay attention. And the editor for this, my publisher, uh, who was not my publisher at the time, of course, an editor came to me out of the blue and said, hey, these are really interesting stories, really important. Could you write a book about this chemical and, and everything you're writing about? And my initial response was, good God, no. Like no one would read a book about a pesticide, right? Or pesticides, uh, particularly one called glyphosate. Um, so no, thank you. And, you know, but then, you know, as I thought more about it and left Reuters and, and in early 2016, I said, oh, maybe so, maybe so. Um, in 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World, World Health Organization, declared glyphosate to be a probable human carcinogen, uh, something that I had been writing about research showing ties to cancer for many, many years by that point. And it really was starting to get a lot of attention. And so I said, yeah, sure, I'll write a book. I don't know if anybody will read it, uh, but it was crazy, the response. So I wrote this book in nine months. And uh, when it came out, it, you know, despite the ugly cover, <laughs> um, you know, it won three awards. I was invited to speak to the European Parliament in Brussels and just universities all over North America and radio shows and podcasts and invited to come and speak in various locations around Australia and the Netherlands and uh, France and Brussels. And, you know, it was just a really incredible response. And um, so, you know, I guess, again, an example of how something you maybe think isn't the greatest idea turns out to be maybe a really good idea. I don't know. Um, so uh, it's been it's been a good ride with that book. And it did sort of um, establish me, I guess, globally as the person <laughs> I told my husband on my tombstone, they're going to put, you know, she knew a lot about glyphosate, you know, right. And uh, the thing that the thing that I know a lot about. Um, I wanted to make a different book. This is my second book that came out last year. I can hold this up. Ah, the screen doesn't like it. The Monsanto Papers. Uh, so that came about because I was following. So glyphosate Roundup, glyphosate um, came to be classified by our International Agency for Research on Cancer as a probable human carcinogen with a particular association to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And what followed was a lot of lawsuits then, you know, uh, mass tort lawyers are saying, wow, you know, this is what they do. They, they see a product or medical device, something that, uh, you know, is initially marketed as safe. And then the science shows that it isn't safe and they go out and they file litigation and they start filing litigation and they started getting discovery documents uh, from inside Monsanto. And so what I, and I'm following all this and going to the court room, going to the court hearings, going to the trials. And I already had a pretty impressive trove of internal documents through freedom of information requests. Um, I sued the EPA twice and the FDA once to get them to comply with the law to turn over internal communications and, and records. So I already had a really good idea and had included in my book, Whitewash, of the collusion and the corruption that had gone on through the regulatory process and through the litigation, what we saw adding on to that was the corrupt process inside Monsanto, internal to Monsanto, where they planned and plotted to manipulate the scientific literature, to ghostwrite scientific studies, to create front groups that they would secretly fund uh, who would lobby and promote the safety of Monsanto products while looking to be independent of the company, but actually taking money from the company. Turned out that some of those front groups, you know, were the ones who were attacking me and putting articles up on their website about what a horrible, terrible person I was. Um, and they were being funded by, by Monsanto. We had all of these internal emails that laid this whole thing out, all of these plans and plots to deceive consumers and farmers and lawmakers. And um, so I decided, you know, let's write another book. And I 
wanted to do this one very differently. My first book, Whitewash, was is a pretty heavy book. It's a pretty scientific laden, you know, with all sorts of uh, studies and, and information about regulatory matters. It's a pretty heavy book. It's been adopted by several universities and environmental science curriculum, for instance. But I wanted a different kind of book. I wanted a book that read like fiction, kind of read like a John Grisham novel, but was still nonfiction, was still true. And I thought this, following this court case, you know, gave me the perfect opportunity. So I zoned in really on the very first um, person, a uh, man named Lee Johnson, to take Monsanto to trial. And maybe this book, um, this was the book, the Monsanto Papers, my second book. And as I said, I really wanted to, um, you know, tell this through the story of, of the first man to go to trial. And I wanted wanted people to understand his battle with terminal cancer and how it affected him and his family and his kids and his struggle when he's told he has 18 months left to live and, you know, and the lawyers that he teams up with and, and just really because it, it really was a, an incredible epic sort of battle of the little guy against the big bad corporation and the internal documents. I mean, it just had all the makings of, of a movie, I thought. And I, I told my publisher, you know, I actually pitched this to them. And I said, I, I this looks like a movie. I can't make a movie that I can write a book. So let's do that. So this is the man, Lee Johnson. I just have a few slides here. This isn't, I didn't put this together for this group. I'm sorry, but this is the man, Lee Johnson. And uh, he was just, just average guy, kind of pulled him up, himself up by the bootstraps, uh, had a really hard upbringing in a bad part of uh, Vallejo, California, didn't really know his father, had an absent mother, didn't graduate high school, got in trouble with the law a little bit, you know, just really struggled um, as a young adult. But by middle age, he was rocking and rolling. He had two kids, he was married. He'd gotten a good job as a groundskeeper for the school district and was super proud that he was, you know, able to support his family in a middle-class lifestyle. And he's spraying these chemicals as part of his job, glyphosate, Roundup. And he has this uh, very unusual catastrophic accident in which he's just doused in this, in this glyphosate weed killer from head to toe. And its protective gear is not sufficient to protect him. Um, and you know, gets inside the suit and everything. And what happens, oh, there we are, I'm very excited. So I've spent a lot of time with Lee and trying to tell this book, trying to write this book to understand his story. And this is, this is the apartment he was living in when I met him and it was a very rundown, he, you know, he got cancer, he's, he has terminal diagnosis, he loses his job because he can't work and he ends up uh, having to move out of the house that he had uh, been so proud of and live in this cramped little dark apartment. This is how the cancer manifested. It was in a mycosis fungoides uh, type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma that manifests on the skin. And so the lesions in the tumors develop externally. They do damage internally, of course, to your organs and, and move through your bloodstream, but you actually visibly can see the cancer. And these, these types of things were all over his entire body and were incredibly painful and, um, and humiliating for him. And it hurt him to move, it hurt him to put clothes on. And he was embarrassed to be outside where people could see, you know, people would stare at him. And, um, you know, it was just a really poignant story, um, this, this painful process he was going through. And then in the book, you learn how he comes to see an ad for uh, the Miller Law Firm in Virginia. And this man here that you see on the left with the standing up and the beard and is Mike Miller. And Mike is quite a character. And, and so you meet Mike in the book and you learn all about him and his wife, Nancy, and their horse farm and their law firm in Virginia and how they uh, you know, have basically built careers uh, off of representing people like Lee, who feel that they've been wronged by big corporations and trying to hold them accountable. And, and so these are some of the other lawyers that you meet in the book. And, um, and these are the, the famed Monsanto papers that the book is named after. These are 
a uh, couple of volumes of internal documents, uh, the emails and communications and everything that I told you about that are just really jaw dropping when you read in detail how these, in, these scientists and, and executives inside Monsanto talk to each other and, and joke and celebrate how they're going to hide the science, ghostwrite the science. They use the words ghostwrite. Um, manipulate the science. Uh, you see them celebrating uh, in early 2000, they were trying to fight back against a lot of cancer scientists who were doing research and saying, it looks like this chemical is genome toxic. It looks like it, it certainly, yes, it can cause cancer. This was through the 90s and the late 90s. And so they're trying to figure out what do we do? How do we fight back against this? And uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have to ghostwrite some some papers. We're gonna have to have scientists who look like they don't work for us um, have their names on the on the scientific studies. And uh, but we're gonna do the the work. And you see them in, internally talking and celebrating when these papers are done, and how they're gonna have their public relations teams push these papers out and tell the regulators around the world to rely on them and. And they're so proud of these eight scientists inside Monsanto that did all of this work to pull these papers together. They're going to get uh, celebratory. They're going to get polo shirts, commemorative polo shirts for them all to wear about all the work they did on these, these independent scientific papers. Anyway, um, and then this is, these are, I have to give a lot of PowerPoints. So this is, you know, just go through, I guess, a lot of what the documents show. Um, but we don't need to get into all of that. So I think there's something in here, if I can get to it, about the front groups. These are, I wanted to show you this. So this American Council on Science and Health um, and Genetic Literacy Project are two of the front groups. And you can see, if you go on their website, you'll find, I don't know, dozens and dozens of articles like this. Um, like Carrie Gillum keeps lying early and often. This one over here is a good one, um, Carrie Gillum you know, and this attorney collaborated with attorney charge and extortion plot, uh, you know, all these really interesting things. You'll see they don't just do it to me. Um, these front groups have also gone after New York Times reporters, Eric Lipton and Danny Hakeem, pretty much anybody in the journalism or scientific communities that dare to, you know, write about science or research or anything that contradicts the industry narrative can, can plan on getting attacked by these front groups. And this is a fun little email. Um, this American Council on Science and Health, which as you see, this is who writes these articles. This is an email, one of many, but this is an email where American Council on Science and Health has asked Monsanto for more money. Uh, and they have, as, through the emails, you see them laying out here all of the things we have done for you, Monsanto, to defend your products and glyphosate. And you see Dan Goldstein of Monsanto here saying, you will not get a better value for your dollar than ACSH. And of course, all of this is, is they're telling the public um, that there's no connection, that ACSH is completely independent, this, there's no money change in hands. You know, it's all, it's just lies, 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 lies. Anyway, um, so we can get off of that. This is part of my work now since I wrote Whitewash is to do a lot of public speaking. Um, what I've learned I think is interesting that, you know, I could, I, you can write thousands of articles. I've written literally, I don't know, tens of thousands of articles over my career as a journalist. Never got asked to speak, I don't think one time to a group, but you write a book and Everything in the book I'd already pretty much written in, <laughs> in news articles, but um, all of a sudden you're asked to speak all of the time. So um, when I speak, I, I bring together additional facts, which maybe you would be interested there. More than 90% of Americans have pesticides or byproducts in their bodies. You know, I mean, this is this is something, as I said, that I have come to understand through my reporting and my work it's more than just telling an interesting story. This is really information that is impactful for future generations. And I have three children and I care very much about what the environment that we're leaving them. And I um, really want to be a contributor to information that helps us make better public policy decisions. So 
these are just some of the slides that I share. And, and this is my dad. This is, I think, my last slide. This is my dad with my daughter, you know, many 23 years ago or something. Um, and this is a group that he helped start, the Sustainable Sanctuary. Um, so I like to share that. But anyway, uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm working on a few different things. So I'm, I am starting to uh, planning to launch this new environmental news outlet on April 25th. And I have some stories that I'm working on for that. There's a, and the idea is hopefully that the, um, some of those will, stories will still continue to run in the Guardian and we'll be sharing that way. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's things going on all around the United States. There's a huge environmental catastrophe that I'm following and writing about now up in Nebraska that has um, done a lot of damage to the water table and the, the water that is um, that runs downstream and becomes the drinking water for Lincoln, Nebraska, and Omaha, Nebraska, and the chemicals in there. So I'm writing about that. And there's a very interesting uh, move in North Dakota where a Chinese company is has bought a lot of land and is trying to start up a um, corn milling plant, uh, which has become highly controversial um, because of different different things. I've started a Substack. I don't know. Do you guys follow? Do you have Substacks? Do you guys know what Substacks are? I've just kind of gotten turned on to that. It's tell us. Huh? Tell us. Uh, yeah. So Substack, I uh, wonder if I can share that. Well, Substacks are sort of a new way for writers to share, you know, whatever they want to write, um, fiction, nonfiction, poetry and and you basically put your work out there in a substack it's free it's a whole platform that's set up for writers and you can invite people through on your email list or friends or you can share it on social media and and it's a way that you can share your writing on a on a platform uh where you can monetize it if you want to uh you can have people gain access just for free uh, or you can charge people to, to gain access. And so some of the really good writers out there uh, are making a lot of money. It's crazy. Like you, know, you charge, I really, I really think it's great. Mine is called Unspun, like, you know, the spin, unspinning the spin, unspun. I don't know. Um, so anyway, um, what else? Any other questions? Could you, uh, could you show us your, your Unspun? Yeah, so this is what it looks like. Um, this is, you know, I'm in, I'm in it, but uh, Unspun, this is what it's about. So you can go to home. So this is an article that I just wrote. When did I write that? A couple days ago. Uh, here's another one. This is what I was telling you about the sad story of Mean Nebraska. Toxic contamination persists in cleanup efforts. Um, and so you can see here, I just did a little teaser. Um, and I said here, I'm going to be writing, where did I do this? I said, uh, yeah, it will take me a while to get all the latest details into story form, but I'll leave you now with two photos that capture some of the catastrophe. So, you know, it, it can be like a personal notebook. It can be op-eds. It can be almost anything you want. Um, Substack.com. Right. Substack.com. Yeah. And um, let me see if I can. The home for great writers and readers. So uh, I highly encourage you to. You can see all of this food writers, comic, finance, bloggers, podcasts, uh, the whole thing. It's a, it's a really cool cool thing, I think. You know, I, I guess I've become so cynical now. I don't trust much of anything I read. It's certainly not mainstream media, not the New York Times, the Washington Post. But there's been such a skewing, I think, of information, particularly over COVID. And just, it's so hard to understand. And news has become so propagandized and on all sides. And so the way I just try to navigate is to just, as I said, go to the source material, 
show me the research study and then show me another research study and let me read 10 research studies and they're probably going to have different findings and then let me try to synthesize that and let me listen to as many different voices and perspectives as I can and what makes sense to me and what doesn't make sense and ask the hard questions. Um, we all have to be, I think, ever more cautious about really not just, not just following by the, you know, led by the nose, um, the loudest and, you know, who, who has the loudest megaphone. Um, I've come to learn, you know, quite personally through covering these corporations, incredibly powerful, incredibly rich, go to great lengths, spend millions and millions and millions of dollars every year on messaging to, to form public opinion in a way that promotes their products and supports their profit agendas. And, you know, that doesn't just happen in the agrochemical industry. It happens in the pharmaceutical industry and in the oil and gas industry and pretty much any industry out there that is about making money. A big part of making money is this propaganda. And so we all know it. I mean, it's part of the game. It's marketing, it's advertising. Um, it, it influences intentionally how we feel, what we believe, how we act, what we buy. Uh, but it's very definitely not in our best interest. It's for the interest of the corporations. So you have to be skeptical and you have to um, be self-protective and, and you have to go to the source material. If you are going to care about and be influenced by what you're reading, I really think you have to be skeptical. And that's why, I mean, in my book, a lot of people have sort of made fun of me um, or, or laughed a little bit about the end of whitewash because I mean, I don't know, there's like 50 pages of links to source data <laughs> because I was so worried that Monsanto was going to try to attack the book, which they did. So I, you know, put source material for almost every single fact I ever stated in the book. Um, it's because of the way that I do write my stories. I, I mean, I, I am very diligent about sourcing and attributing and documenting anything I'm going to write that is, you know, going to call somebody out or be controversial potentially. So this is a story that I just did not too long ago in The Guardian. 120,000 U.S. sites around the United States. Uh, this is EPA data um, that shows that are handling PFAS. Um, they're referred to as forever chemicals. But the, the Biden administration has come out recently and appropriated about $10 billion uh, to try to clean up, remediate, and restrict the use of PFAS chemicals now because they're known to be so damaging to human health. And because all Americans, actually pretty much people around the world, um, are known to have PFAS uh, residues in your blood serum now. Um, because these chemicals are so pervasive and so damaging. But Blad, as he was telling me on Wednesday, he is, is fighting. He sent another, he sent a letter last month, he said to the Biden administration, uh, because he, he says, you shouldn't, the taxpayer shouldn't be funding this. $10 billion of taxpayer money shouldn't be out there cleaning this stuff up. The companies that have been promoting and pushing these chemicals should be the ones um, paying to clean this up. And He's bringing litigation against 3M now um, because they were a big purveyor of it. So one of those chemicals, it's really only recently um, been banned after years and years of political fights is called chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos is known to be so damaging to young children's brains, um, does neurological damage exposure, main exposures through the diet, through food and water. Uh, the EPA said many its own scientists in the EPA said many years ago, there's no amount of chlorpyrifos that is safe in food and water. The, the tiniest, teeniest amounts cannot be considered safe. Uh, and yet it's been used liberally in farming, in production of fruits and vegetables, and was kept on the market because Dow Chemical um, lobbied to keep it on the market, court orders, and, you know, uh, ordered the EPA to take action. The Obama administration said they were going to ban it. 
was supposed to be banned in 2017. Trump came into office. Dow Chemical gave a million dollars to his inaugural fund and sent their lobbyists to meet with him and the EPA, to meet with the EPA in April of 2017, and the ban went away. And I just tell you this all because that is just one example. And there are hundreds and hundreds of different pesticides that are used uh, in food and farming. And residues of these are commonly found in our food. So is it going to kill you if you eat a bowl of strawberries, you know, with chlorpyrifos and atrazine and glyphosate and dicamba and 2,4-D and, you know, imacloprid and no, it's not going to kill you today. Is it going to make you less healthy? Yes, it's going to make you less healthy. It's going to contribute to the other toxins that you're exposed to in the air and the water and plastics and this toxic soup that we've created with our modern world. And, you know, depending on your lifestyle and your habits and what other things factor in, you know, maybe you'll develop cancer, maybe you won't, maybe you'll develop Parkinson's, maybe it will contribute to liver uh, disease or others. We are made less healthy by the environmental contaminants that we are exposed to. And so if you can reduce that exposure in any way, shape or form, I think that's a good idea. You see this? Yeah. So, yeah. so PFAS is sort of, um, as I said, it's a whole array of different, there are 5,000 different chemicals pretty much that qualify as PFAS. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of the most common thing. I mean, food packaging, um, these chemicals are found in pizza boxes and popcorn bags and, you know, pretty much everything you take away from uh, a fast food restaurant is going to be something that, that you have PFAS in. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a big concern. This is what, I mean, you can see grease resistant there. It's also found in, um, you know, clothing and um, uh, anything to make things sort of water resistant, grease resistant, stain resistant. Um, it's found a lot in firefighting foam and, uh, you know, firefighting gear, protective gear that firefighters use. Um, so this PFAS exposure, you can see here in this story, um, the studies have linked PFAS to immune system suppression, lower birth weight, increased risk for cancers, um, you know, in things as common as like the paper that's wrapping your hamburger, you know, or salad bowls. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is something I'm writing a lot more about and very concerned about. As I said, I guess at the beginning, the more you know, like just the more frightening and stressful it is just to live in the world. <laughs> uh, there's a, in Canada, there's a movie that was made about a Canadian farmer. Um, Schmeiser, I can't even remember his last name. There it is. Um, Percy Schmeiser. And uh, he, as I said, there was a whole movie made about him. He was sort of representative or emblematic of the fact that Monsanto sued hundreds of farmers um, around the world, uh, a lot in the US, a lot in Canada and elsewhere, and put in place a number of practices to prohibit farmers from doing that, from sort of this traditional practice where farmers would save seed and reuse seed from a crop they grew uh, and then they were able to use that uh, the following year so they weren't constantly buying new seed every single year from a dealer or distributor but when monsanto introduced genetically engineered mm -hmm. crops to the what, world, yeah yeah uh, they those were patented and so Farmers have to be licensees or they have to sign an agreement when they buy the seed that says they will not reuse it, that they will buy it new every year because it's a patented product from Monsanto. And so, and they, I mean, they pretty much won every person they sued. I mean, Monsanto won on this. And, uh, but the movie, what is the name of that movie? I'm trying to find it here. Uh, it really is a sad, sad story. You know, it talks about how it ruined him, basically ruined his farm and, you know, all of his money and that sort of thing, uh, trying to fight against Monsanto. But yeah, so in Africa, and Africa was a huge, I mean, still is, I guess, a, a huge um, goal 
for DuPont and Monsanto and the others uh, to take over Africa, essentially, and to drive modern conventional chemical GMO agriculture into African practices. And, you know, they've been working with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for a number of years. A top Monsanto executive went to work for the Gates Foundation back in the early 2000s and really set up and started to drive that African program uh, to bring conventional seeds and chemicals uh, to African farming and reshape what they grow and how they grow it and that sort of thing. And of course, they say they're doing it to better help stave off starvation and to you know increase economic gains for small landholder farmers. And but critics say they're you know essentially just trying to you know pad their own wealth and control more of the world's you know food supply and et cetera, et cetera. When I was writing both of my books, you know, I had a full-time job and I had three kids and, you know, so the only way I could figure out how to do it was I would, I would carve out blocks of time. So I would say, okay, I'm on Saturday, I'm going to write from eight to four in the afternoon. And on Sunday and at night, I'm going to write from seven to 10 and that's sort of like just blocks of time. And then sometimes I, you'd sit there for an hour and I couldn't even write a sentence, you know, you're just sitting there sitting, but but the process of carving out time that was devoted only to writing. And I felt like if I waited until I felt moved to, you know, or the words came to me or something, that would not work very well.